Welcome to a new episode of the Future of Business podcast. I'm April with Fast Future Publishing, and on today's podcast, we feature author Hardin Tibbs reading his chapter, Futures Thinking, a Critical Organizational Skill. If you're interested in learning more about the book, The Future of Business, or about any of our authors, check us out at www.fastfuturepublishing.com. In this chapter, Hardin Tibbs, a highly experienced futurist, strategist, educator, and writer, highlights the importance of developing critical futures thinking skills that enable organizations to anticipate and to adapt to change. Here's Hardin Tibbs reading his chapter, Futures Thinking, a Critical Organizational Skill from The Future of Business. This podcast is a recording of the chapter that begins on page 516 of the book, The Future of Business. The chapter is titled, Futures Thinking, a Critical Organizational Skill, written and recorded by Hardin Tibbs. Introduction. What do organizations need from the skill of futures thinking? Do they need knowledge of the future as such, or do they just need to know when and how to adapt to possible future change? This chapter looks at the general concept of futures thinking and at the way its key principles can be derived from the tension between the limits to our knowledge of the future and the requirement that every organization must adapt to change if it is to survive. A number of existing methods in the field of futures research were developed with the goal of creating knowledge about the future. Knowledge creation looks desirable precisely because it follows the pattern of other academic disciplines. Unfortunately, when the notion of knowledge is applied to the future, it throws up unexpected paradoxes. What we can observe and research in the present, in other words, what is real now, is change, from which we can make inferences about the future. At first sight, this appears to be a similar process to hypothesis formulation in scientific research, but the model of hypothesis followed by empirical or experimental testing does not work for practical futures thinking, because by the time the future happens and either confirms or falsifies the hypothesis, the knowledge obtained is no longer directly useful. It is no longer knowledge about the future, but about the present. Not only that, but one of the basic tenets of futures research is that it is not possible to know the future with certainty. Sometimes this limitation is expressed as an aphorism. There are no facts about the future, because the future is inaccessible, or at least it is to present-day technology. If this limitation is taken seriously as a criterion for dealing with the future, then it follows that setting up knowledge creation as the aim is misguided, despite the focus of many futures methods. Unthinking adoption of the usual academic criteria has led futures research away from a practical focus. It is often asserted that what makes the hard sciences useful is that they can make predictions, much as Newtonian physics is able to predict eclipses. But these are all in principle predictions about carefully isolated subsystems of reality, with simplifying assumptions made about other aspects of reality, mainly that nothing unexpected will intrude from the larger system. Predicting the actual future implies being able to know the future of reality as a whole, as an open-ended system without any convenient simplifying assumptions, and no field of science is able to do this. The same limitation applies to prediction technologies, for example, ones based on big data. They will undoubtedly improve rapidly as computer intelligence and the volume of data both grow. Increasingly accurate predictions will be possible in operational situations where the behavior of the system is statistically well known and simplifying assumptions about extraneous variables can be made safely but it will prove much more difficult in open system situations involving strategic uncertainty that has never been encountered before. In other words, prediction technologies will be very useful for operational management and are likely to prove more effective than older prediction-focused futures research methods. However, they will be of limited use for strategic leadership, and as a result, the uniquely human skill of futures thinking is set to play an increasingly important role in strategy particularly since we are in a period of rising volatility.
For all the above reasons, futures thinking does not aim for objective knowledge about the future, but takes the adaptive needs of organizations as its focus. To see how this is different, consider an ecological analogy. The organization is like an organism that occupies a particular environmental niche to which it is well adapted. Its routine activity in this niche corresponds to operational management, but if the environment itself changes, the organism will have to adapt and evolve in order to survive. For the organization, this deeper change corresponds to an external challenge that demands strategic rethinking. By analogy, therefore, the aim of futures thinking should be to provide the organization with a means to scan its strategic environment for signals of significant change, ideally as weak early signals that foreshadow loss of fit with the future strategic environment, and if these are found, to prompt a process of adaptive change in response. The distinction here is between normal operational variability, which requires managerial agility in response, and strategic shifts, which require the organization to rethink itself at some level, in the extreme, by reinventing its own identity. Three principles emerge from this. The first is that the research focus must be on what is changing in the present and on insight into the dynamic system structure that is being observed. It is worth noting that the ability to recognize change in the present depends at least in part on a knowledge of the past, for the simple reason that change requires the passage of time to become visible. The second principle is that a representation of the insights into the strategic situation must be integrated into the mental models of decision makers if there is to be any effective action. The third is that the payoff is not going to be definite knowledge about the future, but about how to respond effectively to the change. The notion of the future is being used here not as a category of knowledge, but as an imaginative or exploratory space, rather like a graph's time axis, in which to project continued change of the type already observed or imagined potential change that could arise given what is known about the nature of the underlying system. Because the first principle involves facing the present as an open strategic system, this means the present situation will never be known with certainty or in its entirety, not only within the research budget of any real organization, but not even in principle. It is the immense complexity of the real world and its freedom to develop in unexpected ways that makes this an impossibility. For this reason, much of the research will be indirect and will focus on understanding the perceptions, perspectives and mental models of a diversity of knowledgeable industry participants and observers. Fortunately, this can yield very useful insights into the structure of the strategic situation. From all this, we can conclude what futures thinking needs to look like to be of practical use to organizations, a conclusion borne out by the author's futures consulting experience starting in the early 1990s at Global Business Network, GBN, in California. In simple terms, there are three key futures activities that need to be adopted as cultural skills by the organization and acquired as personal skills by the individuals within it, particularly by the senior leadership. First, there is the practice of observing change in the strategic environment, which calls for methods similar to ethnographic research used in anthropology, with a particular emphasis on conducting unstructured or conversational interviews. Second is the practice of sense-making to interpret the change and derive implications about the future. This ensures that management's action frame and mental models of the present and future are kept up to date. Third is the creation of adaptive and advantage-seeking responses, which is an activity very similar to design thinking. In other words, seeking integrated solutions to multiple simultaneous strategic and goal-related criteria. These three activities are not a futures research method as such, because the second activity itself will typically make use of a futures method in the narrow sense, for example, scenario development. Rather, these three are the methodology, using the term in its strict sense, of futures thinking seen as a vital cultural praxis every organization needs for its survival. A special thanks to Harden for reading, and a thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in today. If you do like the podcast, do us a favor and go into iTunes and Stitcher Radio, however you listen to this podcast, and give us a rating or a review. We'd really appreciate it. 
If you have any specific feedback, you can always send it to me at april at pastfuturepublishing.com. And to pick up a copy of The Future of Business or to learn more about us, visit us at www.fastfuturepublishing.com. Until next time, I'm your host, April Corey, and I'll talk to you all later. Music